Well, well, um, thank you, Frieder, and um, Chancellor Kosla, Assemblyman F Fletcher, and distinguished guests from the Bauhaus, faculty, students, and friends. I um, am going to be, I'm less well endowed with protection <laughs> than some of the previous speakers, but I am dressed better for the weather. And that's because I am, um, I suppose, uh, among my many hats, and I'm wearing none of them right now, I suppose I'm here because I'm an artist, so no ties. But it was good to see so many friends coming here, including some I haven't seen in years. Uh, Bob Aiken of Symer, we worked together and were office mates in a building just over the hill there, um, back in our graduate student days here at UCSD. It's an honor to be invited to speak at the dedication of UCSD's latest wonder, the mammoth and magnificent, uh, oh, I should mention, I give a lot of talks each year and none of them, no one else did I bother to write a script for. <laughs> You're that important. Uh, the mammoth and magnificent structural materials and engineering building, whose every trait and design features should help unleash creativity for those who work within. Built by the people of this state with help from generous donors, it represents a major investment in the future of the University of California system, which I deem to be one of the diadems of all human civilization. I think the UC is that important. Here you'll find the new home for endeavors ranging from the ultra small up to the macro, even mega, scales. Problem solvers within these walls will send robots into the bloodstream and mysterious nonlinear realms within the cell. New work in fluidics, materials, and battery storage systems will help us tackle ve vexing energy problems, extending efficient sufficiency to many of the world's rising poor. Here researchers will test the stability of the earth and strengthen the structures that we plant upon it. They'll innovate and improve the vehicles that carry us across and under the seas, or into the sky and into space. The composites that make up our vehicles, aircraft, and sporting equipment will grow stronger and lighter and save vast amounts of energy while making us safer. Some will be, capa some will be capable of activity these new materials flexing like muscle or reshaping themselves on command. They might also possibly serve as substrates for embedded computational elements. So that the phrase smart materials will take on new meaning. Uh, is this resin? Should I pull this back? Is this all right? Okay. Medical devices will spin out of here and people will make a lot of money on them while making us live longer and uh, us boomers stay around to be crotchety for a while longer, I recommend you young students put up with it and make the world better despite us. It will be an amazing world when your shoes, your shirt, and your dinner plate all actively compute according to your stated desires, responding to your will, learning to serve you with the same graceful assurance that you now expect when you command your fingers to move. Imagine such a world when the addressable space given to all human beings by IP version 4 was one website per human, and that seemed like a lot. IPv6 is going to allow us to assign an internet address to every cubic centimeter from the surface of the sea to a mile up. And that won't be enough. When every one of your dinner plates and shoes and articles of clothing is going to be engaged in negotiation and you better hope that your house computer is your friend. <laughs> but I want to speak, I want to remark about another milestone. It is 50 years since the great philosopher C.P. Snow gave his famous address lamenting how the academic world had divided into two cultures, one scientific and the other consisting of the arts and humanities and so on. Both realms attract great minds, 
Yet, Snow appraised how these worlds of discourse appeared to speak different languages, parse different logics, and view reality in fundamentally incompatible ways. Academic scholarship in the humanities and arts seemed to view truth in a rear view mirror of citation, reputation, and precedence in a tradition going back millennia. Science took a very different approach, and one that seemed disturbing, in which fame or reputation could always be trumped or overcome by fresh facts. In this new culture, every assertion was viewed as contingent, requiring perpetual reevaluation through criticism and scrutiny by the next experiment or the next. And yet, this contingency did not lead to murky chaos, but to ever rising confidence in an ever-growing model of the world, a confidence that we wish we could convey to some of our fellow citizens at this point. Science distrusted the squishiness of subjective reasoning. In return, those who dwelled across campus saw scientists as boffins, obsessed with merely solid things, bereft of vision or soul. Underlying this divide was the noxious notion that limited so many of our ancestors, that of the zero-sum game. The assumption that you cannot achieve new powers without abandoning or losing something else, perhaps something precious. Snow despaired over these two cultures ever crossing their divide, though he hoped that it would happen somehow, someday. And behold, behold. That someday, that somewhere, is here at UCSD, the bottom left corner of a continent that some say is tipped, so that anything loose can roll down here, <laughs> into a wondrous pile. That the dream is coming true here, where members of both academic cultures want it to come true. We just heard that although each of them blames the other politely for the reason why this building is going to be a melange of two cultures. It's very sweet to watch them do that. <laughs> Here, in this marvelous new SME building, fiercely pragmatic researchers and dissectors of objective reality will share floors with the Department of Visual Arts in spaces that are deliberately intermingled so that engineers will constantly find themselves engaged in conversations with white brain creators. And our friends from the Bauhaus know what energy, what emerges when this happens. Something called design. The joyful blending of, of breakthrough technology and artistic sensibility. Extravagant imagination merging with utilitarian vision leading, it is hoped, to spaces and tools and devices and projects and inventions, as well as wonderful frivolities. My wife told me to pause at that point. <laughs> that people not only find useful, but love to use. That they relish using. And perhaps, maybe even our AI descendants will decide we were cool because we had such style. And perhaps may also reflect a growing prosperity and love of the earth. Attention to the design becomes clear as you wander this new building. Observe the way open space is used, taking advantage of views and the spectacular San Diego environment. A paradise indeed, the one that is also a desert with little water or energy to spare. And so the design strives hard to compensate with breakthrough efforts at efficiency. Within you'll find groups and departments arranged in clusters that gather professors near their students around common collaborative areas. Then other commons areas attract interactions between departments and groups. Seth Lehrer spoke of building bridges. <laughs> what better metaphor than the bridge I'm standing on, although it seems to seems to lead nowhere. <laughs> That's just a metaphor. An SME is well situated to simulate, to stimulate the rest of the campus. I think I'm going to wear these. To stimulate the rest of the campus 
encouraging ideas to infiltrate outward and within. This building will thrive because its cells are leaky, its structure is malleable and adaptable to changing needs, deliberately almost biological. Not a rigid expression of one architect's ego, but a willing servant to many more generations of pioneers who will work within these walls and who will want to move some of the walls to make this structure fully theirs. That is the way design will have to be in the future. Not a single architect's ego, but making buildings that thrive and breathe and are partners with us. And speaking of the future, the SME has not left out foresight, the gift that springs as if from the prefrontal lamps of our brows, shining light on the perils and opportunities ahead. Two institutions will dedicated to foresight will have their homes here, the Center for Design and Geopolitics and the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. It happens that I had a, a humble role in helping Professors Sheldon Brown and David Kirsch plan this bold venture with the Clark Foundation, whose representatives are here today. And every single dean at UCSD, along with the heads of Salk and Neuroscience Institutes, Institutes and many other partners, aiming to bring to bear the tools of science and the arts toward plumbing a great mystery, where does the fantastic gift of imagination come from? I care about it, it pays my meal tickets. But how can it be taught and nurtured? Can we simultaneously unleash imagination with greater freedom, yet better harness it to individual and human needs, and make it more answerable now and then to reality? This cross-fertilizing goal of the Arthur C. Clarke Center is a fitting tr tribute to Arthur's life, both as a scientist and visit vividly prescient storyteller, and one who was my personal role model. I'm proud that my alma mater is on honoring him with this bold endeavor. May I mention a, another pertinent point, though? More successful science fiction authors have emerged from UCSD than any other campus on Earth, prompting one of your predecessors, Chancellor Kosla, to ask, is there something in the water no, it is in the air, in the ambiance, in the attitude of a civilization, a state, a county, a campus, a building, that views, sprim, that views prim scholarly categories as mere suggestions, a place where the core emphasis remains on our scientific projects, using new structures and new materials to augment our tools, aircraft, buildings, even our lives. But where that process benefits and derives much from open-mindedness, curiosity, even humor and art. A place where collaboration, innovation, and flow between cultures is not only allowed, but encouraged. Even better, it is taken for granted, a palace for the positive sum game. The notion that we are not bound by limiting assumptions. I can always be a little more than I am. It is the theme of a new culture that some find frightening in its hubris. One that is so brash and confident that it takes up the challenge we were thrown long ago amid the rubble of that tower in Babel. A challenge to grow mature, more inquisitive, not less. More able to listen to each other, not less. To regather in a polyglot world to decipher the universe, to love and understand it and become its co-creators. Until truly, as was once promised, we find that nothing is beyond us. Thank you.